Thank you very much, everybody, for coming. Uh, welcome to this uh, meeting of the British Astronomical Association. This is the fourth meeting of the 133rd session. And uh, first of all, I'd like to welcome any new members. If there are any new members who have never been to a meeting before and would like to be personally welcomed by the president, that's me, <laughs> tell me. <clears throat> that's my first time. Oh, ah, excellent. a new member. What's your name, sir? Uh, Daryl. Darren? Can you come up here? And, uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is this an AA? <laughs> <laughs> It's lovely to meet you, Darren. Hi. And, uh, Darren, yeah, yeah. Darren yeah. yes. And uh, I hope you have a productive uh, and uh, enjoyable time with the BAA. And uh, allow me to welcome you to the association. Cheers. Uh, next, I'll inform you of our forthcoming events. We've got the ever popular Winchester weekend course in a place somewhat near Winchester, uh, <laughs> coming up on the 14th of April. Uh, it's at Sparshalt Agricultural College, and I think it's all booked up now, actually. So nope. yeah, it's all booked up. Uh, so uh, look forward to meeting many members there. Uh, on the 29th of April, uh, the SPA, Society for Popular Astronomy, have a meeting at University College in London, and BAA members are very welcome to go <laughs> to their meetings, and their, their members are welcome to come to ours. We have a meeting on the 13th of May in Cardiff. Uh, that's our spring meeting, and that's on the theme of cosmology, galaxies, and stars, and you can book up for that on the website, uh, and um, please, please, uh, we, please do so. We'd uh, want to... Uh, Want to have a good meeting there. So uh, that's uh, the spring meeting, 13th of May in Cardiff, on the ever popular subjects of cosmology, galaxies, and stars. Uh, we've got a sectional meeting on, uh, shortly after that, a week after that, on the 20th of May, Saturday, Saturday the 20th of May, in Birmingham. We have, have the historical section meeting at the Birmingham and Midland Institute, and you can again book for that on the BIA website. And then the next meeting here will be on the Wednesday, the 7th of June, and that will be the meeting that includes the George Alcock Memorial Lecture. At uh, this time of the year, we always have, and we have to have by our bylaws, what is called the Special General Meeting, and this is specifically for the Treasurer to recommend the new subscription rates uh, which will uh, come into effect uh, this year, uh, and the members have the opportunity to comment on them, to oppose them, to uh, put any counter proposals forward, and uh, then then to approve. But it's only the people who are here in the hall who can vote on that. So I'll now ask uh, Graham Wynne Stanley, the treasurer, to tell you uh, what his proposals are and why he is making them. <coughs> Thank you, David, and uh, good evening to everyone. Um, as you know, the uh, association has been running a substantial deficit for the last few years. And whilst the uh, association has very healthy reserves, we do need to ensure that uh, they're not going to dwindle away too rapidly. Um, it can become a bit of a, a habit that could uh, be difficult to break should we uh, manage to, uh, to get through all the years for some years in the future. So in order to maintain the sort of level that we've been going at for the last few years, I do feel that we should have a modest increase in our subscription. So... Here is the what I'm proposing in the uh, column on the left-hand side there, uh, there alongside the current subscription. <laughs> so basically, um, we're looking at two pound a year increase on the digital membership. But we've also been looking at the cost of distributing the journal 
um, the printing cost on the postage comes to about £21 per annum for each number. So that gives for six issues. So uh, basically the difference there between the ordinary and the digital membership is basically that, that £21. Um, so that was my suggestion. So that uh, the Christian Leader senior members, like myself, uh, would see an increase from £37 to £45.50. There is an alternative, of course, um, that uh, you could opt for the digital membership instead, um, which is at a much more modest level and has little more than a half the uh, monthly printing issue. Now, it's possible that the number of printed copies may go down, um, but of course we're then going to save on on the printing costs, should that happen. Um, so I would like to um, put that to you, if there's any comments or questions. Um, yes, uh, to yes. Jeremy Shears would like to um, comment. Yeah, yeah, I'd just like to, to comment. I, Mr. Treasurer, thank you very much for the, the hard work you've put in, I, into this, and I fully support uh, an increase in subscriptions for the reasons you have suggested and the analysis that you've done. With one exception, uh, and that is I would have a counter-proposal to keep the young person's subscri subscriptions in both categories, so the, the printed and the digital, at the same rate. And the main reason for doing that is I, I would like to encourage more young people to join the association. So this may facilitate that. Uh, I'm also aware that there are financial consequences to doing that. However, it's an unfortunate case that we don't have that many young people as members of the association. So the, ab the absolute uh, hit on the bottom line is going to be rather small, sadly rather small. So that will be my counter-proposal. I'm happy with the other subscription rates, but I would propose to keep the young persons the same. Would anybody else like to comment? on that or any other aspects. Yes. Sir. So I'm, I'm, I'm not a senior member, <laughs> but the increase for seniors is 23%. Yeah. I, I think that's quite substantial. I mean, if you're assuming that seniors might be on a pension and pensions are rising by about 10% this year, I think uh, 23 is quite a jump. Yes. Uh, it, is a, it is a conscious policy that we are bringing the senior membership rate closer to the ordinary membership rate. Uh, the, the general feeling in the Board of Trustees is that um, a, an age-based cut-off like this is no longer justified, it, taking in, in, into account what, what actually are the incomes of these different groups in society. And so we, would, we are working towards having only one rate. Yes, sir. Young persons, I mean, most of the young people here, as you said, will take it electronically anyway, won't they? So, well, in generally. That, that, that was my yeah. uh, initial thoughts, but apparently it, it's split about 50 50. Is it? The other, the other question is if you implement this today, would that bring this deficit away, so that would bring us on, onto a lower bar? Or is it still, is you ex still expect a deficit next this year? Sorry, you mean, do we expect to, to be in deficit? Yes. Oh, yes, yes. I mean, the, the impact on our income is not that vast. We're talking about £9,000 in that income. Well, that, that's based on the current membership. Yes. So, OK, just to follow up on what you just said about the senior rates, why did the senior digital only raise by, um, increase by two then? if you're trying to bring parity? <coughs> well, there, there is a working group at the moment looking at the structure of the, um, of the membership. So the categories may well get revived, revived after their recommendations. But that, that wouldn't come in this year. It's, it's, I, I, don't, I don't know. I think we didn't think about, about that. Um, I, I think 
nobody suggested that. Yeah. Yeah. David, the, the big increase for seniors is actually based upon their senior digital rate and adding the £21 for the magazine. So basically, up until, if this is passed, up until now, seniors have been getting their magazine cheap. The main reason for the cost increase is that uh, cost of paper has increased a lot. No. I think it's cost of printing about, by about 20% this year. <coughs> well, also, ma membership subscriptions have not increased for a number of years. No. So I think it still represents very good value. Andrew. Um, just to come in on what uh, Jeremy raised and the other comment, we actually have um, 19 young people who subscribe to the paper journal and 10 who subscribe to the digital membership. And so the, the effect on not increasing the uh, young persons would simply be £58. Right, very small. <coughs> In the scheme of things. So we, so we have a proposal from the floor uh, for to accept this with the proviso of keeping the uh, young person's rate the same as it was this year. <coughs> would anybody like to second that proposal. Nick James is seconding. Right, I'll, I'll take a vote on that. So the proposal is that we accept these rates except for the junior rate which will remain as it was last year. All those in favour? <coughs> All those against? Any abstentions? One abstention. <coughs> two. Two. two abstentions. Right. Uh, well, it's, it's carried then. The, the, so the subscriptions will be as here, except the junior subscription will remain the same. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank you. Right. We can now move on to do some astronomy. Now. We have to stop sharing this um, uh, this uh, the subscriptions uh, slide and make contact with Professor Alan Harris. David, we'd like the papers. Right. Oh, I've got the papers. Yes, yes. Let's have the papers uh, commands. This is uh, Jeremy Shear, the paper secretary, and he will announce what papers have been accepted by council today. Very good. It's actually a very active period of submission of papers to, to the journal, which I'm delighted to see. And this afternoon, Council uh, accepted for publication five new papers. Uh, so I will list the, uh, the names of the titles and the authors. Uh, first one is Lunar Domes Near the Crater Cleomedes by Raffaella Lina. Then there is a free Excel-based application dedicated to UBVI Photometric Studies of Galactic Open Clusters by Walter Arno. Then there is Early Members of a New South Wales Branch of the BAA. Uh, by, uh, this is a, a multiple uh, author paper by Nick Long, Wayne Orchiston, Anthony Kinder, and Tona Stevenson. The next paper is Pulsar Detection and Verification with Small Aperture Antennas by Peter East. And the fifth one is a rare outburst of the WZ Sagittae type dwarf nova PQ Andromedae by Gary Poyner and myself. Thank you very much, Jeremy. <coughs> so, uh, Professor Alan Harris is going to join us uh, by Zoom. Uh, Professor Alan Harris uh, is a graduate of the University of Leeds and he has held positions at the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy in Germany and at the Rutherford Astrophysical Laboratory. He is a senior scientist for the German Aerospace Center, uh, Institute of Planetary Research in Berlin, and he also holds an honorary chair at Queen's University, Belfast. Uh, he's a very a big name in the field of uh, defense against asteroids, He's a member of the International Asteroid Warning Network and the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group, which are both to do with the United Nations, and they coordinate actions to uh, mitigate, hopefully, uh, the impact of any near-Earth asteroids. Uh, 
And from 2012 to 2015, he led the European Commission's NEO Shield project. Now, fittingly, he has an asteroid named after him, 7737. Uh, so, Alan, where are you today? OK, uh, I'm located in Berlin. In fact, I live in Berlin still, although I'm now retired from the German Aerospace Center, but I still have an office there and a sort of guest scientist contract, as they call it. So I still, I'm still active in, in this business. Very good. So Alan is now going to tell you <coughs> the truth about near-Earth asteroids. And there will be good news and there will be bad news. Alan Harris. Okay, thank you very much. For um, right now, the uh, yeah, I, I don't have to say anything more about myself. I think you said it all. That was very good. Uh, let me see if I can get that asteroid rotating again. There it is. Is it rotating? Yes. 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 Excellent. Okay. Now, um, asteroids and comets. Let's move on to the first slide. There we go. Uh, the question is, um, to what extent are these things of benefit to us and to what extent uh, can they be a problem? Um, let's go back to the very beginning. Um, the, our solar system basically formed out of a cloud of, of gas and dust that collapsed, this is according to modern theory. Uh, and at the center of that cloud, the, the sun formed. So we started off with a very young sun, and uh, as the cloud collapsed, it rotated. And therefore, um, we ended up with a disk of uh, gas and dust, basically, around the newly formed sun. And it is in within that disk that uh, little dust particles came together. They collided, they stuck together, <clears throat> and we ended up with, uh, with small dust grains that grew into sort of gravel-like objects and small boulders. And uh, if in, in regions where enough material was present, these things would continue to grow uh, until eventually they'd reach uh, a size of what, 10 kilometers somewhere to 100 kilometers somewhere in that region. And at that size, gravity started to play an important role and more and more material accreted onto these, some of these objects anyway, and they grew further into planet, the sort of planets that we, we know and love today in our solar system. Uh, other objects also grew, but uh, a lot of them were, were, were uh, destroyed by collisions. Uh, <coughs> and these collisions led to a lot of debris being spread around. Um, the, obviously, the, the larger, the very large objects could uh, absorb, could accrete the smaller uh, particles or, or objects in, in this debris disk, and they continue to grow. So we're, we're, what we're left with now are um, the planets that we, we know, and a lot of debris, basically, from the collisions that took place in the very early days or very early phase of the solar system. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cough today. And... Uh, yeah, the, the asteroids and comets that we, we see today are basically uh, uh, largely the, the debris that, that is left over from the phase of, of planet uh, formation. Um, so basically, our, our Earth, our planet, uh, formed out of these small objects, and, and the, the asteroids and the, the comets we have are, are related, if you like, to the objects that that uh, the building blocks, if you like, of the planet. So we can learn a lot about the, the conditions and processes that led to the solar system uh, as we see it today from studying the uh, by studying these these objects, the, the minor bodies, as we call them, of the solar system, the asteroids and, and comets. Uh, another aspect here, which is very important, is the fact that these uh, minor bodies, asteroids and comets, actually contain complex organic molecules, including uh, indeed amino acids, which are uh, the very building blocks of life. And these, these complex organic molecules actually form on the surfaces of dust grains in interstellar space. Uh, and so wherever you have uh, dust accumulating, you will end up with organic molecules as well. So they sort of, they're everywhere, basically. Um, and um, we also have seen organic materials in, in meteorites. So basically, the idea is that um, asteroids and comets um, that collided with the newly formed Earth 
um, probably brought organic materials uh, to Earth as well as uh, water. Lots of obviously uh, comets contain uh, water ice. Uh, asteroids, carbonaceous asteroids also contain lots of water. And so somehow it's not quite clear how it all happened, but um, the Earth, I think, owes, owes the fact that it has life and it has water to uh, collisions with asteroids and comets. So in this sense, they are a positive benefit to us, friends. Um, and we can see also in the case of um, uh, uh, materials that are very important to us in our modern industry, um, that asteroids carry lots of materials which could be um, could be important in the future. At the moment, we, we obtain these materials such as the platinum group metals uh, by mining them on Earth. Um, but the everything basically we have on Earth is also present in asteroids. Um, and if uh, these materials become very, very difficult to extract or, or we run out of them somehow on the Earth, it's possible in the future. I think quite a long way in the future, to be honest, asteroid mining is not something that we can we're going to start doing tomorrow. But um, for uh, future generations anyway, especially if they're active in space, uh, could mine asteroids for these uh, very important uh, um, materials such as the platinum, platinum group metals and indeed water. As I said, uh, carbonaceous asteroids contain lots of water. You can break water down into hydrogen and oxygen and use it as rocket fuel. Um, and also, obviously, for, for uh, uh, people um, um, working in, in, in space. So this is a futuristic thing, but it's something that might become economically viable uh, some way uh, in the future. So again, asteroids are, from that point of view, uh, of benefit to us, so we call them friends. Now, let's have a look at another aspect, and we can look at this plot here of, of uh, lots of orbits of what are known as potentially hazardous asteroids. Um, there are now, I think, something like 2,300 known potentially hazardous asteroids. Um, and the definition is that for an object to be potentially hazardous, it should have a diameter of 140 metres or more. And that strange number is there for historical reasons. Um, and they have to come very close to the Earth i.e. within about 20 or their orbits uh, or they can approach the Earth's orbit to within about 20 times the distance between the Earth and the Moon. I should point out that uh, we sometimes talk about potentially hazardous objects and near-Earth objects and then we talk about potentially hazardous asteroids and near-Earth asteroids and the difference here is that if you say if you call something an NEO or a PHO it, it includes comets whereas a PHA, obviously, we're just talking about asteroids. The comets play a relatively minor role in, in, in the impact hazard. They are, they can be, they can impact the Earth, uh, but there are re relatively few of them, and the impact risk uh, stems primarily from asteroids. Um, we know, um, I think we know that none of the uh, potentially hazardous asteroids that we have discovered so far uh, are going to hit the Earth in the next 100 years or so. But not all of them have been discovered. I think we've only discovered about 50% of the estimated total population of, of potentially hazardous asteroids. Uh, another point is that, of course, uh, some of these things occasionally pass close to orbit, uh, uh, close to planets, such as the planet Mars. And in doing so, their uh, orbits can be perturbed. There are also um, effects due to solar radiation, which cause a, a very slight drift in the orbits of these things, so they ha they have to be monitored. Um, and uh, but we can say with some certainty, I think that uh, up to about a hundred years from now, we are safe from uh, a, um, a very um, a disastrous impact of a, of a large asteroid. Uh, that is only true of those we have discovered so far, of course. Um, I should say also that there is a very steep uh, size distribution of asteroids um, such that there are far more smaller ones than bigger ones. Um, and we know that even very small particles, little bits of grit and, and even bits of ice and, and so on, <clears throat> when they enter the Earth's atmosphere, they're visible just about every night as, as meteors. Uh, and larger objects uh, create uh, fireball displays. So this is a daily or nightly occurrence, um, whereas um, 
we have impacts of larger objects uh, much less frequently, thankfully. So, on the 15th of February 2013, there was a fireball over the city of Chelyabinsk in Russia. This thing was a super bolide. It entered the Earth's atmosphere with a velocity of 65,000 kilometers per hour, and it exploded at an altitude of about 20, somewhere between 25 and 30 kilometers above the ground. Um, I'm sure many of you um, will, will remember this. It was in the headlines, um, <clears throat> and it was a big surprise because we didn't see it coming. It came roughly out of the, the, dis the direction of the sun. Uh, <coughs> it was a had a diameter of about 18 meters. It was an asteroid, uh, and the, a huge amount of energy was released in the atmosphere, but fortunately at a very high altitude. So, And because the, the thing came in as a very shallow angle, uh, the, the release of energy was distributed over a very, very wide area. And had it come down um, <laughs> nearly vertically, that energy would have been concentrated in a much uh, smaller region and would have created a lot more damage than this did. Uh, nevertheless, I think uh, some thousands of buildings were, were damaged, mainly due to glass windows breaking and the glass being blown out. Um, uh, and also uh, this, these glass splinters um, caused, about, I think about 1500 people to, to go and get uh, um, um, medical help. Um, uh, we, we expect an event of this kind to happen something like every 100 years on average. Um, uh, so it's not something we can completely dismiss as, a, as a, um, just a freak occurrence. Uh, we should be aware that this sort of thing does happen and it can it could be a lot worse than uh, the Chelyabinsk event. So um, unfortunately these things, asteroids and comets can hit the earth and therefore uh, they can do us damage. Um, so while they have contributed to, to the conditions that made life in the solar system possible, they also have the potential to destroy it. Um, and I think really uh, until just a few decades ago, the impact hazard was, was not really taken seriously. There were some indications. We knew that there were some asteroids that could come pretty close to the Earth, but nobody really, uh, because it's not something you, you really witness every day. You know, it doesn't happen very often. And you can have, you know, people, generations going by without any serious impact happening. Um, people were aware of the Tunguska event in 1908. Uh, we don't know a lot about that. It's a, a sort of a little bit mysterious. We don't even know if it was an asteroid or a comet. But there are eyewitness reports that something pretty uh, amazing, pretty significant happened. And we believe that was uh, due to an impact. But apart from that, until Chelyabinsk. Nothing, nothing much had happened. But even before the Chely, Chelyabinsk event, uh, a lot of uh, a, a large number of, of or the, the number of asteroids being discovered increased dramatically as we <coughs> as we um, uh, used uh, uh, ever um, better uh, telescopes with sophisticated software to scan the skies, and uh, these are now largely automated uh, telescopes that that are in use every night. And we've, we've, we now know of about, I think, 31,000 near-Earth objects in total, um, which, uh, you know, can come pretty close to the Earth. They're not all potentially hazardous, but um, uh, they are objects which, which pass with, I think it's, um, uh, I forget the, the exact uh, the distance, but they, they come, uh, uh, their orbits could evolve to actually cross the, the Earth's orbit. Uh, so we have a, um, a bit of a problem here, and uh, we have to think in terms of whether we could deflect um, a, a hazardous asteroid. And the uh, various ideas have been put forward as to how best to do this. And I think we can say now that we have reached the level of technical competence at which we could deflect a hazardous object. Um, so what techniques could we use? Let's have a look at some of these ideas. The one at the top of the list is called the kinetic impactor. And it's what we call, um, it's, it's a member of, the, of what we call the, the, the impulsive techniques. Um, and it's basically, it's very simple. You simply um, uh, steer a, um, a spacecraft into an asteroid. You cause it to collide with the asteroid, thereby transferring momentum 
to the asteroid and changing its orbit. Uh, this is a very simple idea, obviously in practice, as, as it tends to be rather more complicated than it sounds, uh, but it's, it's, um, it should be very effective. Uh, another one that you will have heard of if you've seen these uh, movies that um, come out occasionally on, on this subject is the nuclear option, as we call it, and the idea there is simply to uh, bring a nuclear explosive device into the vicinity of the asteroid uh, and thereby causing the radiation um, to impact the surface of the asteroid which causes material to be blown out uh, and uh, this causes a push in, in the other direction. Uh, this is obviously fraught with uh, political problems and is something that it is impossible really, at, especially at the moment, to test. Uh, and we would dearly love to test any technique that we want to use to deflect an asteroid before we have to do it in an emergency. Uh, so the nuclear option is, is, is possible, it's technically feasible, but something we tend to put on the side and, and, and think about, well, maybe if we had our backs to the wall and there was no alternative, if we were faced with a very large object at a very short notice, then it's something we might have to consider. But that is extremely unlikely to happen because any large object we are almost bound to see many decades in advance of it actually impacting the Earth. So uh, I think a better technique, although one that works very slowly, is, is the so-called gravity tractor. Uh, and that involves um, letting a spacecraft, if you like, fall down towards the surface. Uh, you can see the picture in the middle at the bottom row there. Uh, fall down to the surface of, a, of an asteroid. The asteroid might be, say, two to three hundred kilometers, uh, sorry, <laughs> two or three hundred meters in size. It has a very weak uh, gravitational pull, but nevertheless, the spacecraft would gradually be drift down to the surface of the asteroid. And the idea is then to fire the thrusters of the spacecraft to maintain a constant distance between the spacecraft and the asteroid. And the effect is, is to actually tow the asteroid. You're pulling the asteroid then using the gravitational attraction as a tow rope. And it takes a long time, um, uh, especially since the asteroid is a lot bigger than the spacecraft, uh, but over a period of, of maybe 10 to 20 years, uh, you could, uh, you'd need a lot of advanced warning obviously to do this, but then you could gradually change the orbit of the asteroid so that it would then miss the Earth. And the advantage of this technique is it's highly controllable. You can, you, you can, uh, uh, you know exactly uh, where the asteroid's going to be. Um, you can tow it in whichever direction you like uh, so that you, you have a very accurate uh, result. Whereas in, in contrast, the, uh, the, the uh, kinetic impactor and the nuclear option are sort of like bang and hope type uh, uh, techniques in which you wouldn't be able to accu accurately predict the, the result of, of the, the attempt. Um, there are others. The laser ablation idea is where you fire a powerful laser beam onto the surface of the asteroid. This uh, kicks out a lot of uh, material from the surface, ablates uh, material, uh, and that leads to a kick in the opposite direction, a conservation of momentum. Um, and the iron beam idea is, is, is a similar thing where you're firing a beam of ions onto the surface and that uh, also um, uh, transfers momentum. To, to the object. These are obviously also rather weak effects that would take a long time to have a, a significant, uh, <clears throat> to change the, the asteroid's orbit uh, significantly. But they are, uh, all of these ideas have been considered that they're, they're, uh, you can read up papers on them in the literature. The one I'm gonna talk about, you might have guessed already, is the kinetic impactor for very good reasons. So let's move on to that. Um, so why am I, what gives, what qualifies me to sit here and talk about this business? Well, um, a, a long time ago now, um, in about to the year 2002, I was, I had a phone call from somebody at the European Space Agency, and they were interested in becoming involved in the business of um, uh, the impact hazard. I think with, a, with an eye on what was going on over the other side of the Atlantic, because NASA at the same time was already uh, already had some activities <clears throat> in this field. And so the European Space Agency was, was keen to get involved and they wanted to know how, how best could they have a, an impact, as it were, um, 
uh, in this field uh, and how, how, what would be the best way to spend their money on, a, on some sort of space mission that would contribute to our knowledge uh, of the impact hazard or, or even to, to um, how we might deflect an asteroid. So I set up uh, a panel. Um, these are people I, I, that were very active at the time. Most of them still are, I think. Um, and uh, they, they were, um, I think, the best people available to, to take part in, in this business at that time. So you might recognize a few other names here. Alan Fitzsimmons, Queen's University Belfast, Simon Green from the Open University, both in the UK. Uh, and we had uh, Willie Benz from uh, Switzerland. Patrick Michel is at the Côte d'Azur in France and uh, Giovanni Vasecchi. These were the members of this panel. Uh, <clears throat> Andres Galvez of ESA uh, was, in, was in charge of um, uh, telling us what to do and, and discussing uh, the uh, progress with us. So we eventually came up with a report. Uh, the idea was that we should, uh, yeah, going back a bit, the, uh, uh, the ESA had put out a call for proposals for uh, space missions which could contribute to either to our knowledge of asteroids or to, to uh, the discovery of near-Earth objects or to the, uh, the physical characterization of asteroids, uh, investigating them, the, the physical parameters that are important for um, uh, uh, the, the uh, business of, of uh, deflection. So we, were, we had these three missions. These were all uh, space telescopes. Uh, two of them were actually uh, um, with attempt to, um, uh, uh, to discover near-Earth objects. Um, to survey the sky for, for new near-Earth objects. And one of them was a, an infrared, an optical and infrared space telescope for physical characterization. Uh, there were also three rendezvous missions that were proposed. And these were basically uh, to, to, the idea was to go very close to an asteroid or a number of asteroids and, and uh, derive as much information as, as one could about the, the internal structure uh, or the, the composition uh, and, and these sorts of things, which would be important to know about if you wanted to deflect an asteroid. The one we chose, however, is this one called Don Quixote, and it is basically uh, a test of a kinetic impactor. Um, it uh, also had other experiments on board, like a seismology experiment, uh, which actually made it fairly expensive for ESA, and this could be the reason why, although ESA thought the idea was great and we were praised for our work and they actually did um, a number of studies on, on this um, idea, uh, it wasn't actually followed up with uh, enough money to turn it into a, a mission in the end. So we selected Don Quixote. It's called Don Quixote because there was a team of uh, uh, Spanish engineers that were involved in, in the proposal originally. And uh, that's where the name came from. Um, the idea would, was to have two spacecraft, one of which was a reconnaissance spacecraft. Uh, you can see it down here. Do you see, the, do you see my arrow here? Um, anyway, th this, this, uh, the uh, spacecraft in the bottom right-hand corner uh, is um, a reconnaissance mission that would be launched first. Uh, and this would go to the asteroid and would um, orbit around it and study it, study it in great detail so that we would understand something about its, uh, its physical characteristics. And there was a, a, a second spacecraft in this concept, and that is the impactor, which would then um, uh, come in and, and impact the asteroid, uh, creating a crater and throwing out a, a cloud of debris. And after that, the reconnaissance mission would go back in and study the effects of the impact in, in detail and look at the size of the crater, look at the, uh, the debris, debris that would have fallen back down around the crater and so on. So, um, <clears throat> as I say, ESA commissioned some studies of this uh, uh, in 2006 and for a year or two, uh, this, this idea was studied in detail. We, we said that... Um, uh, the, the Don Quixote has the potential to teach us a great deal, not only about the internal structure of a near-Earth asteroid, but also about how to mechanically interact with it. And that was really the important point, because nobody had tried to do this before. We talked a lot about asteroid mitigation or asteroid deflection, but nobody had actually tried to deflect anything. Uh, it had only been done in, in, in the computer, in simulations. 
And so we said that uh, Don Quixote could provide a vital link in the chain from threat identification to threat mitigation. And then after the uh, studies that ESA commissioned, not a lot happened. Um, ESA, we weren't able to persuade ESA to take this further at that time. Uh, but <coughs> uh, a couple of years later, <coughs> there was a very um, big conference that took place, um, quite a prestigious conference uh, sponsored by ESA, NASA, JAXA, and a few other <coughs> agencies and so on. And they came up with this statement in their white paper, published in 2009. This was an IAA, that's the in Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics Planetary Defense Conference. And they said ESA's Don Quixote mission should be funded. Opportunities for uh, international involvement. Uh, uh, I can't read the rest of it because <laughs> some little things in the way. Uh, but support for, for this mission should be pursued. So um, this was uh, quite a, an important uh, uh, support for the Don Quixote idea uh, that uh, we were overjoyed to, to see. Um, and not only that, but uh, a year later, the, um, the National Research Council of the US came up with a report uh, which... <clears throat> said that if Congress chose to fund mitigation research at an appropriately high level, the first priority for a space mission in this field should be the Don Quixote mission that was previously considered but not funded by ESA. This mission would produce the most significant advances in understanding and provide an ideal chance for international collaboration in a realistic mitigation scenario. So things were, were hotting up here. Uh, we, we were um, getting a lot of, uh, we were hearing about the Don Quixote uh, concept that we'd basically uh, the neo the neo map uh, group had basically forgotten about really by now by 2010 <coughs> but um clearly other people had taken note and were interested in it um this was the next thing that came up in 2012 a paper that was presented at the european planetary science congress uh, entitled dart the double asteroid redirection test and the people involved in this were actually uh, three people that were involved with the NEOMAP uh, studies uh, years earlier, uh, and Andy Cheng from the Johns Hopkins University, um, and, and uh, this guy, Reed, he was also at JHU. And they came up with um, this idea of for DART, the double asteroid redirection test. They state in the introduction that DART follows the previous Don Quixote mission study performed by ESA. 2005 to 2007. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, th there was a very clever idea involved in this that I should explain. Um, the, the, the target asteroid in this case for the DART mission was not just an, an ordinary asteroid uh, orbiting the sun, it was indeed a double asteroid, an asteroid with a moon. And this particular asteroid with a moon, which wasn't known about when we did the, the NEOMAP study, um, this uh, is, has the special properties that it, um, as you view it from the Earth, the moon orbiting the primary asteroid causes eclipses and occultations, which are visible from the direction of, of the Earth. And this means that uh, the light curve, that is the, the changes in the reflected solar radiation, I mean, you only see asteroids uh, normally via, in the optical, via the reflected solar radiation or light. And um, all asteroids, of course, rotate, and you have uh, a rotational light curve, uh, which is, in this case, is not of interest to us. And so the, the data I'm showing here has the rotational component taken out of it. And what we're left with are um, uh, features, dips in the light curve, which are due to the... Uh, uh, the eclipses and occultations of the of this eclipsing uh, binary system, and you can see how this works. Here, you you we're, we're sitting at a maximum of the light curve when you see both the 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 primary object and the moon together in this view. Um, what happens next is the moon uh, goes uh, behind the uh, asteroid, the the primary asteroid, and, and and in fact it goes it moves off into its shadow. 
And, and this leads to a dip in the light curve, as we see here. In this case, you see both objects full on again. You're at a maximum again of the light curve. And here, um, you see the moon coming down, casting a shadow on the primary. That leads to a slight kink in the light curve here. And then as time goes on, the, the moon moves over the surface of the, of the primary asteroid and you end up with a deep dip, as you can see here. Now, the point here is that if a spacecraft were to come along and change the orbit slightly of the moon, it would change the positioning of these dips in the light curve. And so it would be fairly straightforward if you have the right telescopes based on Earth uh, to actually determine to what extent the moon of this asteroid has been, or the orbit of the moon has been perturbed by, by, an by the impact of the DART spacecraft. And that was the idea. Uh, and this, of course, meant that the Americans could go ahead and do this without requiring a second spacecraft, because uh, um, people had thought, wouldn't it be fantastic if we could have the Don Quixote mission um, and split the effort between Na NASA and ESA so that the idea was NASA would do the impactor and the European Space Agency would uh, uh, launch the, the reconnaissance uh, um, spacecraft. And unfortunately, it didn't happen quite like that. Uh, but with this um, target, this binary asteroid target, NASA said, well, we can go ahead and do this. We don't need a reconnaissance mission. We can, we can um, do, do the main objective of this uh, uh, idea simply using ground-based telescopes. And then we can work out the change in the orbit of the moon and we'll know whether the kinetic impactor technique works or not. And that is true, except that if you have a reconnaissance mission, you double the amount of science you get out of this because you can then go in and, and, and look at the, the crater in, in great detail and uh, work out all of the physical characteristics which are essential to a complete understanding of uh, the, the, um, the amount of momentum that's been transferred to the asteroid. In the end, um, NASA gave the go-ahead for the final design and assembly of DART in August of 2018. Um, and the idea was that it, it, the spacecraft would have a, a CubeSat on it a Lys called Lycia. This is a CubeSat um, that was provided by the uh, Italians. And the whole lot, uh, the CubeSat would separate from the main spacecraft as it approached Dimorphos so that they would actually get some, and indeed they did get uh, um, some um, images of the actual impact of the spacecraft into Dimorphos, the moon of this system. It's Didymos is the original main asteroid here. The moon was, was called Dimorphos. Um, and in the meantime, uh, the uh, ESA had decided not to go ahead with the, the European side of this, <coughs> of this concept. Uh, but after... <laughs> That, that was, uh, they changed their minds after uh, NASA gave its go ahead. And indeed, um, uh, I think in about, was it 2019, uh, the European Space Agency decided, yes, we do need to launch um, um, a reconnaissance mission to, to study Dimorphos in detail. And the uh, mission was a sort of um, watered down version of an earlier expensive, a more expensive mission. Uh, so the, the, the new mission is called HERA, and the launch has been delayed. It was should have gone in the original idea, obviously before DART, or or, or should have been launched at about the same time of, as DART. Uh, but indeed, it will now not launch until 2024, and uh, will arrive in about 2026. In the meantime, DART has um, actually done its stuff. Uh, last um, was it last uh, September, I think. It uh, reached Dimorphos. And I, I hope this video works. Um, this is a fantastic sequence. Uh, each frame um, was, was uh, they, they sent down a frame per second. So this is, is wildly accelerated. Uh, but you can see the spacecraft dart coming in past the primary object here on the left. Uh, the original fear was that, um, uh, whoops, yeah, there we go. Uh, that uh, it would the spacecraft would autonomously head for the the brighter object but it didn't it went for the moon uh dimorphos and this is actually the last image we have from that sequence and 
it succeeded beyond all expectations. You can see on the right hand side, the last image that uh, came down. Uh, this is two seconds before impact. The area covered is about, it's about 30 meters across. Um, and it's a it's fantastic detail, as you, as you can see. It was, it was a, 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 an incredible thing to, to witness. I sat at home in front of my TV set uh, watching it and it was just brilliant. Um, the images you see on the left are from the Hubble Space Telescope and they, they were taken 22 minutes uh, on the left, five hours, that's the middle frame, <clears throat> and 8.2 hours on the right after the impact. And they show the expanding plumes of ejector from the asteroid's body. So a lot of material was ejected from the surface uh, and it was immediately obvious that this thing had been a, a fantastic success. Um, again, this is another um, animation. Um, it's a time lapse of infrared images from the, the James Webb Space Telescope or JWST. It covers a, a time period of about five hours and you can see plumes of material uh, emanating from a compact core um, where the, uh, from the point at which the impact took place. Um, and so, as I say, a DART was launched on the 24th of November, 2021. It impacted the moon of Didymos called Dimorphos with a targeting error of only 17 meters. Uh, Dimorphos is about 160 meters in diameter and, and uh, uh, these, uh, the engineers got it to within 17 meters. So it was quite uh, very accurate. And that it did that on the 27th of September last year. And now, we were expecting that the impact would cause a change in the orbital period of Dimorphos of a few minutes, sort of anything from three to five minutes or so. The actual uh, change the re uh, the, was 33 minutes. So the period of Dimorphos, the moon, around the primary asteroid, which was originally 11 hours, 55 minutes, was reduced by 33 minutes. So the... Uh, the net result was um, that uh, the more momentum had been transferred to this asteroid uh, than we expected. And the, it, it wasn't so much a transfer of momentum as an enhancement in the transfer of momentum due to the uh, debris, due to the, uh, uh, the material that was ejected from the surface, because that would have given, um, uh, obviously, through the conservation of, of momentum, any material coming off in the negative direction will boost the momentum in the, in the positive direction. Uh, and so we're very pleased with the fact that this does seem to be uh, a very effective means of, of deflecting asteroids. Uh, this is a very, uh, this is a great sequence again uh, from the, uh, the Atlas uh, system. Um, and the sequence, this sequence consists of 185 images taken every 40 seconds. So we're looking at about two hours of uh, elapsed time. And you can see uh, what happens when the when DART impacts the asteroid. You get this amazing cloud of debris, which uh, simply uh, moves outwards into, into space. Um, and that is, um, uh, the, these are, are fantastic pictures, the likes of which I've, I don't think, well, nobody's ever seen before, I think. Um, and uh, again, here, this video on the right is, uh, taken it's a, a video constructed from images taken in november uh on november the 30th uh last year from an observatory in new mexico and it shows that the didymos system has become a comet as you see now the material the the debris from the impact is is stretched out due to the the solar radiation into a long linear tail and um we're looking at about uh, 32,000 kilometers across the field of view at the distance of Didymos. So you can see that this is uh, a huge, great long tail now. Um, just a little bit about, again, about the, the results from this. Um, I, I talked about the, the momentum transfer um, and, and the, in fact, the enhancement of momentum due to the ejector. And, and the, 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 this beta factor here on the left-hand side is, is crucial in, in um, estimating the, the, uh, uh, how effective um, a kinetic impactor is and and we were um, you can see from the equation here that if you have zero ejector then you simply transfer the momentum of the spacecraft uh, into into the asteroid um, but if you have ejector you enhance that uh, momentum transfer 
and we were th we thought well it the minimum is going to be beta equals one which is when there's no ejector and the uh, you're simply uh, transferring your, your spacecraft momentum and so we were thinking well it might be 1.5 might be two if we're lucky we ended up with a beta of 3.6 which shows just how effective uh, 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 the this this um or the the kinetic impactor in this particular case was it's a big question uh, obviously as to whether it would work this well on on any other sort of asteroid we just don't know and we'd dearly like to do further tests of this kind um there are many different types of asteroid and they probably all have you know different types of of, of structure um so but this is it, it's a first step and and we've got fantastic information out of this the indication is that the technique is is very effective um and uh we're so far very happy with the results but it'll be some time uh before we know exactly uh what went on here these uh the results i've i've given you so far have been i uh, just really estimates because we don't have the full detail and that will come with hera when when hera finally gets up there it should be launched in 2024 that's next year now and uh, will arrive uh, two years later. And it will perform a detailed post-impact survey of Dimorphos. One important thing that it will give us that we don't have yet is the precise mass of the uh, moon. And until you have the precise mass, you can't really uh, say for sure what the uh, transfer of momentum was and how effective the, the technique was. Um, as I said before, the original European contribution was cancelled by ESA in December 2016, only to be reinstated as HERA in November of 2019. So that is why the launch was delayed and why we don't have the original Don Quixote uh, concept here, but we have something that is very, very similar to it. Uh, so HERA um, is effectively the reconnaissance um, component, reconnaissance spacecraft of, of the Don Quixote uh, concept. Um, so yeah, well, that's uh, about all I have um, so far <clears throat> in my main talk. I've got some more slides uh, in case there are questions or discussion. I just want to end up, as I always do with these talks, just uh, giving you an overview of, of the, the, the problem of, of the impact hazard. Um, it, it is really just a, a, a matter of time before something big hits the earth it's, it's just a natural process as we've seen uh, collisions have led to the formation of planets and there's a lot of debris collisional debris around in space which still continues to hit those planets and um, it's a statistical uh, fact of life that uh, it's just a matter of time before we really do suffer serious damage from uh, an impact it's a truly global problem any country in the world could be affected there aren't any any areas on the earth which are safe uh, there are no areas on the Earth which are preferred. Any any part of the Earth could be hit. And of course, there are many countries on the planet that can't really do anything about this. They don't have the uh, the technique, the technology, the, um, the the resources to to deflect an asteroid. So it, I think it's true the space bearing nations should take the lead in developing a mitigation strategy for the planet, which is already actually in progress under the auspices of the United Nations. And um, yeah, I mean, space agencies and political decision makers have to um, cooperate very closely um, on, on this particular issue. Um, and we'd like these things um, to be tested, to be tried out. We'd like to have uh, avenues of communication in place before uh, we have to um, do this in an emergency. And so there's no better time than the present to actually try and prepare ourselves for what is it might take a long time it, it we it could be generations down the line before it happens but it's going to happen and uh, we don't know when and i think we should be prepared for it so uh, i'll end there and um uh thank you for listening i hope you are still able to hear me i've got no idea if anybody's listening to this uh, uh but i'm happy to to take questions now thank you Thank you very much, Alan. Yes, we heard you splendidly. And uh, that was a, a really interesting summary of the whole subject. Uh, I'll open the topic to any questions from the floor now. Nick James. Alan, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. 
So it's, it's just a question about Dart. So the, the momentum enhancement with Dart was, was probably quite unexpected, wasn't it? Um, yeah. In terms of kinetic impactors on other asteroids, I guess you'd expect there to be less enhancement because most asteroids aren't rubble piles like that was. But is there anything you can do with the impact to try and, in, you know, in, enhance the momentum transfer by sort of breaking up the asteroid or something and, and making use of that in the recoil? Hmm. Um, I don't think uh, that sort of thing has been... You, you mean sort of maybe hitting the asteroid first with something or yeah. having two impacts? There's one that sort of comes in and breaks it up and another one that... Yes. Uh, yeah, so having s some kind of explosive thing that would, would kind of oh, fracture it yeah. and then... Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think that's actually been thought of. Uh, um, I know that the uh, there's an American group looking into the uh, uh, the nuclear option, and they have a sort of a com it's a sort of yeah it, it's a combined kinetic impactor come explosive uh, idea, in which you would you would basically fire uh, your or your your spacecraft would would hit the surface of of the asteroid and maybe dig into it a little way, thereby causing some some disruption. And then your uh, the nuclear explosive device would would blow and, and do the rest. Um, <coughs> this is something that <coughs> uh, I don't think is is being widely discussed at the moment. I mean, anything involving a nuclear devices, um, uh, yeah, there are there are certain groups in the states which are interested, but uh, certainly I don't think many people in Europe are, are, are taking that sort of thing seriously at the moment. Uh, as regards other types of asteroids, um, it, it's, it's certainly true that uh, it worked very well on Dimorphos, uh, which is presumably a rubble pile, one would expect it to be. Um, but if it, it has been said that if you have a monolithic lump of rock, for instance, which is not a rubble pile, you might, uh, it might work better because um, you would then uh, split up the surface, break up the surface and, and have... Uh, um, material being thrown out whereas with a rubble pile you'd expect some of the energy from the impact to be lost in simply rearranging the the, the surface of the asteroid or, or you know even deeper down uh, uh, redistributing material um, within the thing uh, so um, it I don't really know to be honest it's an interesting point as to how well this would work on other types of asteroids. It's also a very important point that, that needs to be looked at. And I think there are people doing uh, simulations, uh, computer simulations, to look into exactly that question. Um, but it, it was always, um, I, 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 I suppose I can say, a, a, a sort of, I was a bit skeptical about this, using uh, the moon of, a, of an asteroid right from the start, because uh, we think that the asteroid moons form uh, from um, material that has been spun off the the primary asteroid, um, there are there are um, phenomena uh, which can cause an asteroid to spin faster and faster, and then material gets thrown off the surface, and this this material can then sort of condense, if you like, and form a, a moon, and that's how we think, and that, that that would then be a rubble pile. There's no question if it formed like that. Uh, and so this is maybe, it's not a typical sort of asteroid that we might one day have to deflect. Uh, nevertheless, I think once, once HERA has got all the, the information we need, we'll be able to do a very uh, sophisticated analysis, uh, a, a detailed analysis on, on uh, all these, uh, on this particular uh, um, event, on, the, on the, the impact and the, the transfer of momentum. And we'll add like a, a, you know, we have a single point of reference that can be used in computer simulations to help us to decide how, how this might work on, on other types of objects. A question from Richard McKinn. Um, I wanted to ask, you mentioned um, a, a diameter of 140 metres as being the threshold uh, for which we should be concerned about, and you mentioned that as being historical. Um, yes. Is that a figure that you like or do you feel um, from your own long experience that it should be revised in either direction? Um, yeah, I think uh, it depends how you look at it. I mean, the, the original uh, diameter of 140 metres comes about because 
Uh, obviously, when these things are discovered, we know nothing about the size. We only see a, a, a particular brightness. And that brightness can be due to, to size. It can also be due to the albedo. Um, and so um, I think it has to do with the limiting magnitude of the survey programs at the time, which was a long time ago. They've improved since then. So most people now say, well, it, it's, um, it's an awkward number, and why not talk about, say, 100 meters? Um, I think anything uh, larger than 50 meters uh, is um, dangerous, very dangerous, uh, can hit the Earth. Can uh, it, I think, yeah, I mean, we've, we've had Tunguska, uh, we've had Chelyabinsk, and these were all objects which I think Tunguska also was less than 50 meters, as far as we know. And they can cause a lot of damage, but basically uh, we didn't really have a crater in either case. I think beyond 50 meters, one would expect a crater. So you'd have something hitting the ground that can do could do a lot of damage in a, in a built up area. Uh, and I think from the point of view of uh, warning, uh, um, in fact, there is already um, I can I can skip forward to that. Let's have a look. Hang on there. Uh, if you look down at point number three here, uh, you should you, you'll see that the same page, the Space Mission Planning Advisory Group, who, which is one of these bodies that works under the auspices of uh, the UN, um, th this, this has the, um, is charged with starting a mission planning uh, when warned of a possible impact predicted to be within 50 years uh, with a probability assessed to be greater than 1% and the object is characterized to be greater than 50 meters in size. So uh, 50 meters um, is actually taken to be a critical size in, in that case. Um, so yeah, it, it potentially hazardous for me would be anything uh, of 50 meters or larger, I think, really. <coughs> I've had a question on the YouTube stream from Kevin Kell, who asks, was the impact <coughs> of the dart probe head on, or was it catching up from behind? It was head on. Uh, if we go back to there, you'll see, no, hang on, where was the other picture? There, that's it. Um, yeah, D Dimorphos is um, a prograde here. No, yes, pro prograde, right? And uh, the DART spacecraft is coming in from the bottom right, so it's hitting it. It's hitting it head on, which is what you want to do uh, to transfer the the most momentum uh, to the asteroid. So it, it sort of hits it head on. Yep. And another question on the YouTube stream from Thomas Jones. Asks, are there any current plans to have a stockpile of satellites in storage for use as impactors in case of emergency? Uh, the answer is no. Um, we, we should have a sufficient uh, warning time to be able to respond um, without having anything really uh, uh, already in orbit or, or, or ready to launch. What we think might happen is, uh, if it uh, when it comes to the crunch, um, there, there's so much activity now in in the space uh, area that there's always something uh, near a launch pad about to be launched. Uh, the idea would be that you could you could actually hijack, if you like, uh, uh, a spacecraft that is is already in preparation for launch, uh, thereby cutting the time required for. Uh, the development of the mission <clears throat> to to uh, maybe just a couple of years or something, uh, and then you can get something off the launch pad uh, very quickly. Um, obviously, the spacecraft would have to be modified; it would have to have a navigation system and and so on. But it's uh, that's the sort of idea that is is being uh, looked at at the moment. Um, the thing is also that technology moves on so quickly that uh, if you, you some people say, well, why don't we have a spacecraft in storage somewhere? Uh, ready to be launched uh, whenever needed. But, it, you know, within 10 or 20 years, uh, you might want a totally different spacecraft to do the job. Uh, so it's it's something that, that is, is, you know, the, the ideas, the technology ra evolve rapidly. And, and the, the search programs are getting very good now at, at spotting uh, near-Earth objects, even quite small ones. And so we, we believe that uh, in the future we'd have um, a lot of warning time uh, enough time. Uh, we need probably say five years, uh, maybe a little bit more, to actually um, bring it out, get a, a, a deflection mission uh, launched. Uh, it would be better 
if we were to have more time so that we could launch um, a reconnaissance mission uh, first. But we're, we're already thinking about what type of reconnaissance mission, what type of instruments we would need. And all of that will be, um, you know, there will be uh, reports that can be used um, to, uh, people will have thought about these things beforehand. And that will cut down the time required to to get something up there, either a reconnaissance mission or a, an actual deflection mission. Or last question, uh, David changed his mind about that. We, we saw that quite a few of our members uh, pointed their telescope at uh, uh, that system when the impact occurred, and uh, quite a few of us were able to uh, image the, um, uh, the the increase in brightness. So it was a thing that was fully visible to small telescopes. So, uh, did you know that? Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, given what we've seen in in the videos, um, uh, I can well imagine that the brightness could be monitored. As I said, uh, uh, the Dart team had a whole um, array of, of ground-based telescopes looking at this, uh, even quite small ones, uh, looking at the um, the increase in brightness, um, and and that data is is extremely useful to the um, the analysis of, of what actually happened. Right. Well, uh, we've run out of time on that. Well, that was a fascinating uh, talk about a very important subject. Uh, thank you for making time to talk to us, uh, uh, Alan. And uh, another round of applause. Okay, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Now, uh, our next... Uh, subject is uh, staying with uh, solar system objects but uh, we've got a bigger one coming up we've got jupiter uh, john rogers is uh, director of the jupiter section as you probably know he's been director since 1988 long time it's uh, 25 years nearly so uh, he's a retired lecturer in physiology and um, things to do with nerves at uh, understanding nerves at the university of cambridge um, his hobby has been Jupiter. He authored a classic book, The Giant Planet Jupiter, which was published in 1995, which uh, was the best summary of knowledge of the planet in its system at that time. Uh, he's authored a large number of papers about Jupiter in publications, including Icarus, which is a major journal of planetary science and our own uh, journal of the BAA. He's recognized as one of the lead, world's leading experts on um, the behavior of Jupiter's atmosphere. And so he's going to tell us what Jupiter has been doing in uh, the last few months. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much, David. Um, it's a pleasure to be able to talk to the BAA again about what Jupiter has been up to. Um, so could we have, our, uh, we have the presentation? So yeah, um, uh, I'm planning to describe some of the things that have been going on on Jupiter over the last year or so, um, both on, on the large scale, things that uh, anyone with a, a, a modest telescope is able to see, um, down to some of the things that are maybe only visible to spacecraft, but are still uh, developments in the last year because we're learning more and more about the planet. Um, well, what... Um, Is there a pointer on here? And how do I go back? Um, <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> um, let's see if we've got any going back. No. Ah, okay, that's, that's gone back a bit. There we are. Um, that's fine. So, um, probably all of you will have lately seen. Um, the, um, the conjunction of Venus and Jupiter in the night sky, the evening sky. Um, 
There it is on the evening closest to conjunction from uh, a member's contribution on the DAO website. And here it is a, a few evenings later, a Venus with a bright run in Jupiter was moving rapidly down towards the sun. In fact, as far as I'm concerned, it's now disappeared. I don't know if anyone else is still able to see it. Um, well. During the apparition, um, also Jupiter has been up in the northern sky for, for the first time in quite a number of years. And so we observers in England have had a much better chance of seeing it um, than has been possible for, for many years. So here are some images taken from England uh, back in October, those are propositions, uh, by Jeff Lewis, Martin Lewis, um, Rob Bullen, and um, Bill Leatherbarrow. Um, so you can see a lot of detail can now be recorded by people imaging from, from the UK. Um, but um, of course, even more detail can now be recorded, uh, can still be recorded by observers further south. So here are a few images from uh, Greece and Italy. They're not actually the, the finest images that you can get because um, I've chosen a few that uh, happen to be taken during one of the double transits of the satellites. So here you're, you're seeing um, Danny Mead and, and Europa uh, in transit over Jupiter with their shadows. Um, so of course, when that's happening, people just have to take the, the seeing conditions that they've got. Um, but there are really superb images by many observers from around the world. Um, this is a map showing just some of the, um, uh, the, the images that, that we have contributing. Um, <clears throat> uh, if, if you know people uh, who are not on here, um, they shouldn't be upset because just a sample. So there are large numbers in, in, in Europe um, and also applied phosphor down in southern Africa. Um, there, are, there are large numbers in North America and also quite a few in uh, Brazil. And there are large numbers in the Far East and Australia. So we're able to cover events on Jupiter even in the short term uh, very, very uh, well uh, at high cadence. Um, but of course there's also now lots of information from NASA's Juno mission which has been in orbit around the planet since 2016. And in particular, we're getting beautiful images um, from the JunoCam instrument, the camera. And I've been privileged to be working with NASA's JunoCam team uh, throughout the mission. Um, it's an excellent collaboration because they very much value the amateur input um, from ground-based observations, telling them what Juno is going to be seeing and has seen at any given orbit. Um, and also um, the contributions of the, those of us who know what is going on on the planet, saying what was actually happening um, at the time then when the spacecraft imaged it. Um, the, planet, the, the spacecraft is in a highly elliptical orbit um, near polar. Uh, now the period has come down to 38 days. Um, the, um, the, the, the current configuration of the orbit is, is like this. The spacecraft comes in um, from the north over the North Pole, um, but fairly low because the perigee, that is the point closest to Jupiter, has gradually shifted up during the mission. So it's now in the northern temperate latitudes. Um, that's now usually about 3,500 3, kilometers, 3,500 kilometers above the cloud tops. Um, and then after that, it gradually rises as it passes over the equatorial region and goes out slowly and at a very high altitude over the South Pole. Um, the mission has also changed somewhat in the, as the orbit has evolved. It is now passing uh, close to the morning terminator. So uh, perigeve and at the equator crossing are now pretty much over the terminator, and in future perigeves, uh, it will be on the night side. But that doesn't mean we will not continue getting images, because um, the camera has a very wide field of view, so it will still see the Terminator regions for, for quite some time to come, and it will still pass almost directly over the poles, so it will still see half the planet as it passes over the poles, and also it will get great views on the inbound leg. As it comes in before crossing the North Pole, it gets a long sequence of excellent images sufficient to provide a good map of the planet. So what I'm planning to cover in this talk um, starts with the low latitudes and things that we can see very easily with uh, amateur telescopes. Um, the equatorial zone, the, where, where the color that has been very striking for several years has now faded away. The north equatorial belt, where there's been a, a remarkable fading and narrowing, and even more remarkably followed by a revival in a way that we didn't expect at all. Um, the South Temperate Belt, where I'm not going to go into any details, but discuss just the, the metamorphoses of two cyclonic spots, which have enabled us with JunoCam to study particular circulations in, in great detail. 
and then move up to the polar regions um, where we have actually been able to elucidate the uh, dynamics um, with, by, by combining amateur observations and analysis with the maps and images from Juno's camp. And then I end with discussing Juno, Juno's extended mission as it now looks. So this is a series of, of sections of maps um, through 2021 and 2022, um, showing what's happened to the major belts and zones on the planet. North is up here and, and in all the uh, images. Um, so the, the main things are the equatorial zone, which is the uh, region that's orange colored um, in 2021, and that color has faded away during this year. And then the North Equatorial Belt, where you can see there have been major changes, uh, which I'll, I'll discuss in some detail. Um, if you see big changes, apparent, apparent changes in the Southern Hemisphere, those are mon mostly due to longitudes rather than uh, due to temporal changes. So um, those, those are not changes that I'm going to be discussing here. They're just uh, variations of longitude. But moving to the Equatorial Zone, um, this is the, 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 the coloration that was present in uh, the middle of 2021, when it was at its most striking. Uh, and here it is uh, one and a half years later, just past December, when it almost disappeared. Um, it was um, uh, quite prominent at the beginning of the 2022 apparition, but uh, uh, during the middle of the year, it faded quite rapidly. And through the autumn and, and to the present, there's only a trace left. Though some color can still be detected uh, with... Um, some ultraviolet imaging or, or uh, some spacecraft images. Um, in addition to taking images in visible color, uh, a lot of amateurs now take them in a methane absorption band at 0.89 microns, that's just in, in the near infrared. The point about that is that any images taken at that wavelength, because they're subject to absorption by, by methane in Jupiter's atmosphere, um, they, only ref they only show light reflected from high clouds and high ages. So anything you see bright in methane images like these uh, represents high clouds or hazes. Um, and so those include, let's say, the, the, the polar hoods and the both poles and some bright anticyclonic uh, ovals. But just looking at the equatorial region, you can see that the equatorial zone um, in 2021, uh, in particular, the very uh, strongly orange part of the equatorial zone was very bright at very high altitude. Uh, and actually, we detected slow motions there that are, are the first direct probe of motions at such a high altitude near the, near the top of the uh, circulating atmosphere. Um, as you see this year, um, it's much more uniform and it's actually dimmer. I'm not sure if you can see that on the screen because things may turn out a bit overexposed, but it's considerably dimmer than the orange band was in methane. But the latest images, though low resolution, suggest that the evolution may be progressing further. Um, there seems to be a, a, a narrow, more grayish equatorial band developing, also somewhat dark in methane, indicating that uh, we may be looking through to deeper levels um, at, just at the equator now. But uh, we'll have to wait, I think, until the next apparition begins in a couple of months' time uh, to see whether that is really a, a progression. Um, now, moving on to the North Equatorial Belt, um, we've got, had this... Um, cycle of fading and revival uh, to follow during the last couple of years, um, which is very interesting because each of Jupiter's major belts, the North Temperate Belt, the South Equatorial Belt, and the North Equatorial Belt, undergo somewhat similar large-scale cycles of fading and revival. Uh, but in the NEB, these are usually modest. We call them NEB expansion events, and they've been occurring every three to five years since about 1989. The most recent one was in spring 2020. But over a century ago, the NEB underwent much more vigorous cycles, where it would very dramatically narrow uh, and then recover in an apparently um, in, in, in impressively violent manner. But we haven't seen that in the modern era. Until 2011-2012, when we saw a substantial fading and narrowing of the belt, and then it did revive dramatically in 2012. Um, but there were two problems with that as far as understanding it was turned, concerned. First, there was a similarly violent upheaval in the North Temperate Belt adjacent to it at the same time, um, which complicated matters. And secondly, it mostly occurred due, during solar conjunction, so we couldn't really um, say what the dynamical processes were. Well, uh, we, we've now witnessed another of these, and it may be 
complete, or it may not be complete. We have to wait and see. But um, in 2020, um, there had been a typical NEB expansion event. You see here the belt is, is pretty broad and turbulent. Um, and then in 2021, the, belt were, the, the northern part of the belt was fading, as it generally does after a while. These dark spots here, um, we call barges, are large cyclonic circulations, which commonly develop uh, all around the planet after one of these expansion events. So that was a pretty typical cycle. Until the middle of 2021, when the, the regression of the belt didn't stop, it continued to get narrow, it continued, continued to get fainter, until all that was left was, was this really narrow but dark brown NEB south component. At the same time, um, on, on the south edge of the NEB, where there's normally these big dark formations, I call them NEB dark formations or NEBFs, they're also professionally called hotspots because of their appearance in the infrared. Um, they're almost always present, but during this fading process, they disappear. Um, but since then, we've been seeing these little outbreaks appearing, little convective outbreaks, like white spots as we see them, um, in the NEB South component. And to our surprise, those appear to be driving a rather gradual and slow revival of the North Equatorial Belt without the expected dramatic um, convective activity over the whole belt. Um, this slide shows you the, the remarkable thing that happened to the NEB South Edge, to the major jet stream that, is no that normally runs along that jet, that, that edge. I mean, normally there is a very powerful eastward uh, jet stream running along that edge of the belt, between the, the belt and the equatorial zone. And the NEB dark formations uh, move with that jet stream. They are believed to be large waves in it. Um, on this slide, now you should be able to see some vertical dark grey features, but I'm afraid they're not showing up on the screen. Anyway, you can see some vague no, vertical lines here, which represent the edges of them. Um, this is a chart of the positions in longitude uh, along the x-axis versus time going down on, on the y-axis um, of lots of dark spots and features on the NEB south edge. So the vertical ones, which you may or may not be able to see, uh, are the remaining NEB dark formations. But around about August, they all disappeared except for one final one, which was, was here. Um, and as they disappeared, much faster features began to appear, much smaller features moving at very fast speeds, a couple of degrees per day in, in longitude. Um, we'd seen these before in 2011, uh, and we call these the super fast speed. And an interesting thing about these is that it makes the belt symmetrical with the other equatorial jet stream on the other side of the equator. Um, normally those look different because the NEB south edge carries these big dark formations uh, and they move at one speed. The south equatorial belt north edge, uh, the, the, this other jet stream on the other side, um, doesn't have big features on it and it has a much faster speed. But what we found out here and in 2011 is that when the NEB dark formations disappear, uh, the jet stream accelerates up to nearly the same speed as the one on, on the south side of the equatorial zone. So this is telling us something very neat about the underlying dynamics of, of these jets on Jupiter. Now, as, Ju as Juno was sending back images, um, close-up images of the NEB on every orbit, we were able to see what was happening to the cloud texture as the belt was fading. Um, in fact, we were able to follow it all the way through from the NEB expansion event in 2020 uh, right through through to the present. So here it was in 2020. So the, these are uh, low-resolution versions of selected Juno Plan images on, on selected orbits ranging from 2020 July through to 2021 November up here. Um, th this shows the whole image. It's, it's taken from very low altitudes, a very wide-angle image. So the, the whole NEB um, pretty much fills the image. Um, and this is a blow-up of a 5 by 5 degree part of the North Equatorial Belt. So one thing we had always thought from looking at ground-based amateur images was that after one of these big cycles of activity, the scale of turbulence gradually decreases. Um, and we see that beautifully confirmed in these Junogam images, and of course down to far smaller scales than we could ever see from the ground. So this was soon after the expansion event. There were huge, great convective rifts, as we call them, i.e. areas where there are big storms 
uh, erupting and spreading in, in, the, in the belt. Um, and as the uh, fading proceeded, the, um, the turbulence first diminished to, to much smaller scales. And then I'm just going to move on to a, a large version of the last three of them. Um, the turbulence disappeared altogether as the belts faded and went into total quiescence. Um, and we saw this sort of strange amorphous pattern of, of, of cloud tops uh, with not even any indication of the usual gradient of speed that you normally see across this belt. Um, but while all this was happening, now I, I at least was expecting that there would be a vigorous NEB revival with big convective events across the whole belt, and it would occur not less than three years after the previous event. So nothing really would have happened until 2023. Uh, instead, what we saw was that even as the belt was fading, um, we were getting these little bright spots, which uh, are convective outbreaks, i.e. basically thunderstorms, big thunderstorms, uh, erupting in that dark north component that, that, that still existed. Um, and these were increasing in frequency and number in the late months of, la of 2021 and still on through 2022. Um, they're not abnormal, they're, they're seen in normal times, um, but they attracted a lot of attention in 2021 because they were the only things still happening in and around the NEB. Um, and we could establish a typical behavior of them, which you can see here from this, this single pair of images taken on one date, um, because this one was first observed on that particular date. It's a very fresh little bright spot. This one the, on the right with a purple arrow uh, had begun three weeks earlier, and so that one has, has developed. Um, so the typical behavior was that you see a very tiny, very bright white spot appearing. It's also very bright in the methane band. This is a methane image, indicating that it's a plume erupting to high levels, um, i.e. it's typical of thunderstorms on Jupiter. Um, after about a week, uh, it begins to evolve. Um, thin white streaks extend from it in both directions, sheared in, in the atmosphere. Um, a dark blue patch appears next adjacent to it, which is also exceedingly dark in the methane band, indicating that this is a hole in the clouds. So while the little bright spot is, is, is thought to be a huge convective plume erupting from deep below the cloud, below the visible cloud tops, um, adjacent to it, it develops a downdraft, which forms this, um, this dark hole in the clouds. Um, and also at this stage, the plume moves a little bit south, so it's no longer in the NEB south component, and, and it's no longer moving westwards with respect to it, according, which is typical of that latitude, but it moves south into the equatorial zone and accelerates, and, and can even accelerate up to the super fast speeds that we were seeing there by, by these little features that were speeding past. Um, so this is a rather neat um, description of the plumes that we were able to get. Um, also, an, a, a curious feature was that they're all erupting in a very narrow band of longitude, uh, moving with about the rate that you'd expect for the 10 degrees north, which is where they erupt. So this is a, a chart prepared from ground-based uh, observations by Shinji Mitsumoto of the ALPO Japan, um, covering 2021, um, April at the top, the first ones appeared in May, down to early 2222 at the bottom. And as you can see, um, all of them appeared in a very narrow band of longitude, and they all performed in the same way, first moving west up into the left, and then moving east to, up into the right. And the number, so, so, so the, the professionals now call this uh, a stealth superstorm. Something is down there under the cloud tops that we can't see except by these very focused um, convective outbreaks that, that it produces. Well, during um, 2022, it, it has continued to expand and they've continued to proliferate. But um, meanwhile, JunoCam was exceedingly lucky um, in capturing under, the, under its path in, in the camera view um, one of these storms. This is 2021 November. Here is one of them that we had um, monitored from Earth. It had appeared, I think, it's the, uh, in fact, I think it was the one that you saw on the previous slide eight days earlier. Um, this is uh, the, the, the whole image um, showing it in context. That's the North Equatorial Belt. And this is the full resolution version <coughs> on the right, showing you cloud textures 
you know, better with my finger, that there, there are masses of tightly packed bright white clouds um, called, called pop-up clouds uh, in the center. Um, there is a, a hint of spiral structure if you look at the way those are um, arranged around, around the core of it. There's a, a much more extensive uh, array of thin white haze around it, which may, may indicate expansion of haze from an earlier phase of the outbreak. And then in some parts, there are, there are orange hazes that appear to be overlying the white clouds. So Juno Cam picked up a beautiful amount of detail in, in this formation, in, in, this, in this outbreak. Not only that, <coughs> it repeated this good luck on the next orbit um, with the same high resolution. Now, this is a wider field um, map composite of, of images um, showing the, the plume and surrounding features. And all of these arrowed ones are features that we had tracked from Earth. Um, and so we could say how fast they were moving and, and where they were going. And indeed, it was repeated again uh, a few orbits later, um, in 2022 August. Um, this was a particularly energetic and particularly recent one. I think this was its first appearance on August the 16th, when it was a very bright spot and exceedingly bright in the methane band, as imaged by Manos Cardassis in Greece. Um, and it was, was, it was going to evolve over, over the next few days. Um, this image was taken on August the 17th, one day after it appeared, by Juno Cam, and shows the same features as the previous ones. So we have beautiful confirmation of these typical features of these expanding uh, outbreaks. And also another instrument on Juno detected uh, bursts of, of radio waves that uh, are thought to come from lightning, and they were coming from this particular feature. So Juno Cam has, has shown directly that these plumes are, are indeed thunderstorms. Um, so what has happened since then? Well, there have been a lot more of these outbreaks, um, and they and their effects have gradually spread around the planet. So all the disturbance they produce has sort of regenerated the NED South dark formations, which are now moving around the planet. They're very variable, somewhat, somewhat um, inconstant, but they tend to be moving much closer to their normal speed. And dark um, coloration that is, is induced in the wake of these outbreaks <coughs> has very gradually spread northwards. Uh, and also, a bit of turbulence has sort of begin, begun to persist from them. The outbreaks have only been appearing in the north component. But on these maps, the, the, a bit of turbulence and dark material has spread sufficiently far north that it's interacting with the, um, the, the, the what were the barges there. I, I meant to mention that the, the dark barges, the big cyclonic circulations there, um, had faded away towards the end of the fading of the belt generally. But the belt is still not normal because they are still white rather than dark brown. Um, so something is still odd about that. Um, coming up to the present, um, well, at least last, last Christmas, um, this is the state of, of, state of, of, of the belt then. Uh, as you can see, um, it, it's now got a, a few more extensive rifts in it, which are spreading a bit further north and appearing slightly further north in, in, the, mid, in the belt. It's basically looking fairly normal, except um, where these orange arrows are, that the, the barges are still white rather than dark. So something is still not, not normal about the NEB. Um, this is the latest JunoCam image of it from, from the last perigove on, on, on March the 1st, uh, one of those faded barges there. So um, what's going to happen in 2023, um, since my last prediction has, has not turned out to... To, to show what was going to happen at all, um, it, it's very hard, rather hard to predict. It may be that this gradual, um, uh, gradual revival of the belt will just go to completion and we'll forget all about these cycles. Uh, or maybe in 2023 there'll be a further expansion event and, and dramatic expansion to the north. We just have to wait and see. <coughs> okay. Um, I'm going to move on now to... Um, I think I'm, I'm actually... I'm going to skip the whole of the South Temperate Domain because time's a bit short. Um, lots of nice pictures here, but I, th I think I prefer to tell you more about the polar regions. Um, so this is um, what JunoCam saw when it first arrived at Jupiter back in 2016, um, looking at the North Pole on the left and the South Pole on the right. <coughs> so no spacecraft had ever got clear views of the polar regions before somewhat unclear ones from Pioneer 11 in 1974. Um, but what we see here 
is, is that beyond the most northerly and southerly uh, jet streams, uh, the pattern is really rather different. Now, the, the edge of the blue area, which is a, a haze that hangs over the polar regions, the edge of that more or less coincides, we now know, with the edge of the, with, with the, the most northerly or southerly um, rapid jet stream on the planet. And within that, instead of seeing belts and zones, we see this mixture of, uh, of, of spots of various sorts. Now, they're all uh, cyclonic or anticyclonic, as, as are most features on Jupiter. Um, the, the, the white circular ones are anticyclonic white ovals, um, or AWOs, as um, I'm now in the habit of calling them, um, again, like some that we see at, at lower latitudes as well. Um, the more complicated ones are cyclonic, and we call those folded filamentary regions, or FFRs, which is the terminology that has been used for them since the Voyager spacecraft first showed them in detail. Again, they exist at lower latitudes as well, like these, but they're particularly prevalent in the polar regions. Um, but what was the dynamics of this? Uh, north of the, of the last jet streams, we really have very little idea of what the dynamics was. Well, Juno has told us a lot, um, especially the Juno Cam images, and this is um, a, a map just from one of Juno's many perigodes, on which I've marked what we have learned about the dyna dynamical features in the South Polar region. So I'll tell you first about the South Polar region, um, how Juno Cam images have combined with amateur imaging uh, to give an overall picture of the dy dynamics in this region and then show how we're going to be able to do similar um, combined analysis in the North Polar region, now that Jupiter is tilted a little more uh, with its North Pole towards the Sun and the Earth. So um, what the JunoCam images have shown is that um, this, the, the highest attitude jet, called the S6 jet, runs along here and is wavy. It runs along the edge of the dark bluish South Polar region. Um, in some places, it follows the edges of these FFRs, um, in some places it doesn't, but definitely it is wavy. It also coincides exactly with the edge of the over the, 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 the um, hood that over hood overhangs it. But I, I'm not going to go into detail of that. Just poleward of that jet, there is a belt of FFRs, these big cyclonic chaotic regions, um, pretty consistently um, around that latitude, looking fairly similar to belts of um, the, the, the high latitude belts we see a bit further from the poles. Um, then there are anticyclonic white ovals, um, often along the edge of that belt, but not in a very consistent relation. Everything becomes a bit more chaotic. As you get up towards the polar region, uh, AWOs and FFRs are scattered, apparently largely at random. And then at the poles, you get these famous polygons of cyclones. At the South Pole, there are five of them surrounding a central cyclone. At the North Pole, there are eight of them surrounding a central cyclone. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures of the North Polar one later. Um, the, the sort of images from which this dynamics is inferred are shown in the next picture, which is an animation of two Juno cam maps taken probably about an hour apart. I forget the exact time. But during one orbit, it can image for up to two hours of, of, the, of, the, polar, of the South Polar region. And so over one hour, you can see the dynamics, and you can see the jet stream moving here, you can see the circulation in the FFRs, uh, and so on. You have a very beautiful view of, of the dynamics there. Um, but what you can't do is to say, what are the long-term motions, over, well, what are the medium-term motions over weeks or months of, of these circulations as a whole, which you need to know to understand the dynamics of the whole region. So that's where amateur imaging has actually um, come to the fore. It turns out that, um, contrary to anything that we, we imagined before recent years, uh, it is possible for amateurs to image some features, specifically the, the biggest and brightest AWOs, up in this region. So here's a couple of images, uh, one by R. Martin Lewis in the UK, showing uh, an apparently tiny, obscure little bright spot up uh, there in the South Polar region. Well, if you project that onto a polar map, as, as done here with a few images, um, it's here. Um, that's 74 degrees south. And if you then compare that with a Juno cam map taken uh, on about the same day, uh, that's here. Uh, and it turns out this is the largest of the AWOs in the South Polar region, sort of close up down here. Um, and so it was possible to actually track those. In fact, we had already tracked that one 
using, uh, well, but it was done by our collaborators across Europe who called, called the DUPOS team to measure all the amateur images um, and um, produce tracks for them. We were able to identify that spot as one that had lasted for months and had a defined speed to it. Um, so during the Juno mission, we've been able to combine that kind of amateur data with measurements from the Juno maps themselves. Um, and these are tracks of the big anticyclonic white ovals, well, all of the anticyclonic white ovals, in the South Polar region in 2017 here, from late 2016 into 2017. And we've done similar things for 2018 and 2019. Um, so the big symbols are measurements from Juno. Again, sorry, I should have said, this is a, a chart of longitude along the x-axis and time going downwards um, on a scale of months um, on the y-axis. Um, so the big dots represent measurements from Juno camp images. The, the biggest one, um, item A, is, is the largest one that I just showed you. Um, the small dots represent DUPOS measurements, that is measurements from amateur images. And so around opposition for a couple of months, you can get those measurements, as you see around here, and, and we can track regions. And so we could actually prove that the largest oval that Juno saw on its first perigee, uh, near the top there, item A, is actually one that then changed its speed and, and was tracked by amateurs during the, during the, the uh, spring of 2017 uh, and has been maintaining a consistent speed since. And it may well have merged with uh, oval B, um, which was visible in some Juno cam images moving at the same speed, but um, it was not seen as a separate item thereafter. And others we've seen moving in diverse speeds, which turn out to correlate with their latitudes. And um, so it was possible to produce a, a, a graph of the speed of these, um, uh, the, these ovals along the x-axis here, the speed in that east-west sense, uh, versus the latitude <coughs> going up towards the pole near the top. Um, which is very, very gratifying and very interesting because it showed that the zonal drift profile, as we call it here, um, in, in this polar region is actually quite similar to those in high latitude domains where you've got a domain bounded by jet streams on both sides. The difference is in the polar region, you don't see a belt zone structure and there is no jet stream on the polar side. And yet we see the same basic structure in the, southern, in the latitudes spanned by the southernmost belt of FFRs. Um, the speed is pretty much constant and slightly westward moving, that's retrograde moving. And and yet above about 72.5 degrees, um, magnitude centric, these are two, two different latitude systems, never mind about that, 72.5 degrees on this scale, um, north, uh, sorry, south of that, the speed increases rapidly towards eastward speeds, prograding speeds, as you get nearer to the pole. Um, but that only concerned the anticyclonic white ovals. We hadn't been able to measure directly the long-term drifts of the FFRs, the cyclonic features, which are the most abundant features, would they show the same pattern? Well, fortunately, it turned out that some of the best amateur images could even image those. And that had to be done over a matter of a few days, because seeing how very chaotic they are, you couldn't recognize them from one Juno perigode to the next, um, which you can with some of the AWOs. But um, looking at a couple of amateur images, which Andy Casely produced, he's a uh, very very brilliant amateur in Australia. Uh, he produced them and made these maps from them. The white arrows here um, indicate the southernmost belt of FFRs, and you can see it's actually visible in his ground-based maps. And so by comparing these maps over a matter of a few days, we could show that the, uh, the FFRs, the cyclonic features, were moving at the same uh, westward speed as the anticyclonic white ovals in the same latitude band. Um, and so we had a nice coherent picture of that. And all this was published in, in Icarus um, uh, about a year ago. Um, and it's, it's a really beautiful example of professional amateur, amateur collaboration. Um, but what about the North Polar region? Well, um, we hadn't done anything about that until recently, um, partly because features there are much more obscure. Here's uh, a Juno Cam image of it. Um, it, it has um, a, a northernmost jet, the N7 jet, as it is here, and, and we know that it runs roughly along, along here, along the edge of the visibly dark and bluish North Polar region. We can also see from Juno Cam images that there is a northernmost belt of FFRs, um, equivalent to the southern belt, 
um, that uh, runs just, just wholly above it. Um, well, you only see rather small and obscure, not very bright, atisophonic white ovals in the north polar region. You don't see nice big ones that are visible from Earth. Um, also, uh, during most of the mission, uh, the North Pole was tilted away from the Sun uh, and Earth, only by a few degrees, but enough that um, both Juno and ground-based images were not getting such good images of it. Um, now, the northern, the, the northern Hemisphere is tilted towards the Earth and the Sun, so we're getting better images. Um, and also, it turns out now that amateurs are becoming able to, uh, to, to, to detect some images in that region. So here's a couple, uh, well, a whole series from last August. Um, these are all actually taken by you know, Isao Miyazaki, a long-standing observer um, in Japan, who, my oh goodness, I think he, he was contributing some of the best visual drawings of the planet back in the 1970s. And um, he moved on through every stage of, of amateur observation, so he's now producing some of the best um, images of, of the planet. Um, so in this series, um, indicated with a blue arrow, is an antisodonic white oval, not in what we now call the polar region, but uh, in, in one of the highest latitude uh, domains. Um, but I've just shown you that as, as a well, reference point. But up here, you can see some vague white, whitish patches, which actually are, you can see on the map, the northernmost belt of FFRs. So it's actually possible to see those in amateur images. And um, Gianluigi Adamoli, one of our JUPOS colleagues, has measured and, and plotted uh, the positions of those features in, in a lot of amateur images just last year. And um, here he's got a chart. On, on the left there is, is his chart of longitude versus time, the usual arrangement, um, so time going downwards, for a lot of features, which are color-coded by latitude. So the pale blue one there is the big, big in, in current context, uh, actually it's only quite oval that I just showed you. Um, but the brown ones are features at the highest observable latitudes north of the northernmost jet stream. And you can see those have well-defined speeds, um, a, a variety of speeds, but when you look at their relation to latitude, <coughs> as, as shown here on the right, you see that north of that jet, we've got quite a good zonal drift profile, and it's very similar to that of these domains down here, where you have, as I was showing you for the southern hemisphere, a region of several degrees latitude wide, um, which corresponds to the cyclonic part, where there are lots of FFRs, and everything there has a, 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 a fairly consistent um, and westward drift. And then you have a rapid acceleration as you go further north, up towards the jet, um, that defines the, the northern edge of that domain. And we see the same pattern up there in the polar region, but without any northern jet, as far as we can see. Um, the blue line here, by the way, is a zonal wind profile from Cassini, showing what winds were observed. Um, but north of that final jet, it's extremely poorly defined, and it's a global average, and we don't really know what to make of it. And so, so as January, you had identified some of the drift rates for some of these features, we were able to identify many of them in Cassini images, sorry, in uh, JunoCam maps. Um, so these are JunoCam maps of various dates last autumn, um, in, uh, yeah, from August onwards. Um, and the, or the, the yellow um, arrows indicate the features up there in the polar region um, that we had been able to track. And so we can identify many of them actually as FFRs, some of the smaller, brighter ones within that belt. So we hope to combine the amateur and Junocam data uh, in the future to map the dynamics of the North Polar Region as we did for the South Polar Region. Just show you um, a little bit of the um, dynamics of the North Polar Cyclones. So very quickly, because I know I'm running out of time. Um, so um, this is a Junocam map assembled from four perigees of the octagon of North Polar Cyclones. There, is a, there are five what we call filled ones, alternating with three more diverse ones, but they're all well-defined cyclones. And they've all existed for the, the, the five and a half years of the mission, and we continue to monitor them, and they all remain there, um, stable, they're wobbling to and fro sometimes, um, although being jostled continuously by these very dynamic, turbulent, and, and changeable uh, FFRs that surround them. Well, what's with Juno now? Um, it's on a four-year extension of its mission. It's nearly halfway through that. 
Um, and what's happening now is that as the, uh, as the perigee, the nearest point of Jupiter, creeps gradually north, the whole orbit is, is gradually changing um, it, it, its um, orientation with respect to, to the ecliptic. Um, and that brings, and so, so this is the sort of inbound leg of the orbit. That's how it was at the very start. Um, so the inbound leg has gradually tilted. So first it passed the orbit of Ganymede, and they made use of a flyby of Ganymede to reduce the period from 53 days to 43 days. Then it continued creeping further north, and just last autumn, uh, they arranged for a flyby of Europa. So that has reduced the period still further to 38 days, as it is now. And then next uh, December and January, it's going to do a pair of flybys of Io, which will reduce the period further to 33 days. Um, these are uh, the pictures it took of Europa uh, during that flyby. Um, the best pictures of Europa since, taken since the Galileo orbiter, which has been by far the closest approach since then. Um, and this is a close-up, uh, well, an enlargement from, from the first of those pictures, showing the beautiful amount of detail it reveals. And some of these features had never been shown at that high resolution in this particular area of Juno, and are features of interest with regard to the global dynamics and history of the ice crust of the Moon. Um, and Juno Cam is also already imaging Io, uh, still from quite a considerable distance, so it's low resolution. Um, but we're able to identify quite a number of features on the surface. Unfortunately, no active, active volcanic plumes in recent months. Um, but um, another instrument on Juno, the Juno Infrared Auroral Mapper, or GIRAM, um, takes time out from looking at aurorae to look at Io. And because it is imaging in the thermal infrared at 5 microns wavelength, it can see all of these little hotspots all over the planet, which are volcanoes with glowing, la glowing lava. At least warm lava. Um, they're all the volcanic calderas. And um, that has much better resolution than Juno can, so you can see a lot better. So um, wait for Io for uh, the end of this year. We should hopefully have some great images. The only sort of fly in the ointment at the moment is the camera has recently not been returning all the images in usable condition. Um, and at the last perigeo, some were lost apparently because of radiation damage, which is not a surprise, as Juno's changing orbit now exposes it to more radiation than it, than it did and that, that it was designed for. It's amazing that the spacecraft has just continued to function perfectly for, for over five years, um, but there now seem to be some problems, at least for the camera, um, with the radiation exposure. So um, we have to wait and see um, if we're going to get the full batch of images from the next Perigo, which is due in April the 9th, uh, very close to solar conjunction for us and subaltern. Anyway, um, I've used up all my time, and so I'd better quit. And um, I, I'd be happy to answer questions, but I think maybe I could just leave time for, for Mike to give his talk. I think we better get on, yes. Yeah. Thank, <laughs> you. Uh, thank you for that uh, well, lovely, lovely, lovely Thank you for whoever led me that. <laughs> Right, we'll carry on moving outwards in the solar system now in this, to the sense that uh, Mike Fuchs is director of the Saturn, Uranus and Neptune section. Uh, and uh, he's been interested in astronomy since he was seven. And uh, he works in the spacecraft industry as well. Uh, and uh, today he's going to uh, show us some recent observations by BAA members and tell us a bit about what to expect in the sky over the coming months. Is that the one for it? sort of transition period for those of us interested in astronomy. First of all, we've just had the spring equinox, and the sun is now north of the celestial equator, and moving further north of the summer solstice. And this means that the, the days are getting longer, which is great if you like observing the sun, but the nights are getting shorter, so if you like nighttime observing, it's a little bit less time. Allied to that, we've just gone into summertime, which skews everything, which means that if you want to do some nighttime observing, you've got to stay up 
a little bit later in ABBA's last couple of months. But despite that, there's lots of interesting things to see over the next couple of months. Obviously, with the days getting long, there's more time to observe the sun. And the sun is becoming very, very active indeed. And this is a chart of solar activity with sunspot numbers uh, daily and uh, monthly uh, by, provided by Barrett's solar section in Smith. And we can see that the activity is starting to go up uh, into 2023. Radio observations have also provided some information that solar activity is going on. From the bottom, we've got activity from about 2005. And here up to 2023, you can see that sort of activity for flares is increasing. And this is an image of the sun taken by Peter Ticknick. It's only a couple of days old. And we see there's plenty of sunspots on the disk. So it's well worth having a look whether you use a solar filter, um, full aperture filter, or some sort of solar projection device. <coughs> One thing that's always amazed me, I, I don't do solar observing myself, the, the, the sheer beauty of the images that amateurs take in different wavelengths, not only in white light, but in hydrogen alpha and in calcium light as well. And here we can see three images uh, taken by Carl Bowen, all in different wavelengths. We've got the, on the left, we've got a white light image of an active region, the same region in hydrogen alpha light, and then in calcium light as well, all showing different features. Hydrogen alpha images, as you can see here by the Sunfire Dave Smith show, a lot of features. We've got the sunspots, we've got filaments, and of course we've got lots of prominences as well. And that large prominence on the uh, lower right is seen in much greater detail here. It's almost as if material is either coming up from the sun or dropping down from the prominence. So a lot of amateurs enjoy using hydrogen alpha filters, and, and over the next few months I'm sure there's going to be a lot of activity. But when the sun is active, there's a byproduct. We get increases in auroral activity. And over the last, uh, certainly at the end of February, there was a, an auroral storm that was seen to the south of the UK. And more recently, we've had an auroral storm from March the 23rd and the 24th. And this is a time-lapse video by Callum Potter, which is all me. And it's taken over about an hour or so. And you'll see a car come into the image at one point. And this shows the sheer beauty of aurora with all the changing aspects of it. And this is a very fine video indeed. And you'll see a little bit of cloud coming into the image as well. Here's the car. And uh, if you get a chance to see one of these things, they are a very spectacular sight. Observers in Scotland often see aurora. And this one was seen by other amateurs in Scotland. There's a nice image by an amateur called Alan Tuff. And you can see all the various colours in the aurora. Also in uh, Scotland, uh, Dennis Brzezinski took this very fine image of the aurora that night. Uh, you can see Cassiopeia on the right and uh, Persis over onto the left. But this aurora storm actually moved down to some more southern latitudes, so we could see it in, 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 in lower latitudes in England. And this one shows the colours of the aurora taken by Philip Jenkins in North Yorkshire. This storm was seen even further south. There is one, I've uh, got no details of the, the equipment used by Les Fry from Aberystwyth, and you can see the red coloration in the aurora. And then further south in Ilfracombe in South Devon, as seen by Ella Bryant. So it just shows this storm was visible quite first at way down south in the UK. When the next storm will appear is nobody's guess, but it's worth looking out to see if there's any um, uh, aurora around. And uh, certainly for people in the far north of Scotland, they may, over the next few months, have problems with more extended twilight. But we never know what might happen. It, this shows the phase of the moon over the next couple of months. Uh, we've got a full moon in a few days' time on April the 6th. There are two very interesting things. There's a new moon on April the 20th, where there's a solar eclipse taking place. And then the following full moon, we've got a penumbral lunar eclipse. Alas, neither are visible from the UK, but the one, the hybrid solar eclipse, is visible from uh, the, in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific north of Australia. And this is unusual that the extremities of the eclipse track, only a, um, uh, the, the, the umbra won't touch the Earth, so we actually only get an annual eclipse. As we get closer to the centre of the, uh, the, the eclipse, marked by that dot, we get a total eclipse. And landfall, it covers various things, but it covers Australia 
I know Nick is going to go and see this. Is anybody else going on here? So it'd be interesting with the increase in solar activity, what sort of things we might see during totality, maybe more promises, different types of corona and so on. All of 58 seconds. Well, yeah, I was just going to point to say that it's all 58 seconds. Um, not, not a lot of time to do things. Um, there's also a number of lunar occultations taking place over the next couple of months. You can see further details in the BAA handbook. The one quite bright one is on April the 10th, which is uh, the, the moon of Port Sigma Scorpio. And that should be relatively easy to see because it's quite a bright star. There's another interesting lunar occultation on May the 17th. And this is actually where the moon passes in front of Jupiter. And Tom's been talking about Jupiter earlier on. However, this is going to be a very difficult one to see. The, 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 the moon is a very narrow waning crescent. And the occultation takes place in daylight, and it's only 26 degrees away from the sun, which raises all sorts of implications. Um, to say to the implications, I think if you want to try and even attempt to see this thing, you really, really, really got to know what you're doing. You don't want to get the, teles uh, the sunlight getting into the telescope where you could just damage any equipment or your eyesight. What is further about this, in, this uh, occultation, it's not visible from all the way around the UK. If you look on this chart, these are grazing occultations taken from the BAA handbook. A number four cuts through the north part of England into Scotland. If we were to try to attempt to observe this event from Edinburgh, we'd see an occultation. On that track where it shows number four, you'd see a grazing occultation. The Jupiter would be partially or not completely covered by the moon. And south of that would be no occultation at all. Whether anybody will even attempt to do this, I don't know, but it's a very difficult observation to make, and you've got to know what you're doing, because, again, as I said, uh, this takes place only about 20 odd degrees or so from the sun. The most dominant planet in the sky at the moment, presently, is Venus. You can't miss it. You can see it very bright just after sunset. And over, uh, also, apart from Venus, we've got Mercury appearing as well in April. It reaches greatest elongation on April the 11th, so it's a good time to observe this. And this is a, a chart showing the position of Venus and Mercury on that night. Uh, hopefully you won't have a tree in the way. <laughs> At this particular time, it would be about um, 10 or 12 degrees north of the west cardinal point and about 10 or 12 degrees altitude. So it's a good time if you've never seen Mercury to try and find Mercury. Obviously, you don't look, go looking when the sun's up, which would be a good thing for off object for binoculars as well. It has another elongation, a morning elongation, on May the 29th. But this is very, very unfavourable. Although the elongation from the sun is bigger, larger than the one on April 11th, because the ecliptic is very shallow to the horizon, Mercury won't be above the horizon much before the sun rises. We also can see it's near Jupiter at the time, and Jupiter will be coming back into the sky sort of June, July time, so observations that John's already mentioned would be able to make that as well. Venus, as I said, it's the most prominent object in the sky at the present moment. It's approaching its eastern elongation in early June, so it's still not a very large object in terms of angular diameter. Over the next couple of months, it will increase in size from about 14 arc seconds across to just over 20 arc seconds. But with a small telescope, you should be able to see the phase. Um, on the left, we've got an image by David, which is in the infrared. And on the right, we've got an image by Luigi Moroni, who's a very good planetary imager. And you can see in the ultraviolet image, we're starting to see some structural cloud detail on, on, the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the upper clouds. So it's well worth having a look over the next couple of months to look at Venus. Mars is still visible in the sky. It's moving through Gemini. And it's actually quite small. It was opposition in December, where it was over uh, about 17 or 18 arc seconds across. It's now shrunk down. And over the next couple of months, it'll shrink down from about 6 arc seconds to about 5 arc seconds. But with suitable equipment, some features are still visible. And here is a nice set of images uh, taken relatively recently on March 20 by Vincenzo della Vecchia in Italy. And we can see uh, the south is at the top, north is at the bottom. And as Richard has pointed out, there's some equatorial clouds 
visible in some of the, the images and also some of the dark markings and features on both poles. So again, it might be worth, but very small telescopes, you might be able to discern a disk, I don't know, but it's still worth out having a look. <coughs> John has already mentioned Jupiter, uh, he showed some of these images a little bit earlier on, images taken by amateurs. Sadly, it's its solar conjunction uh, on April 11th, the same day as the elongation of Mercury. As we saw earlier on, uh, Jupiter starts to come into the morning sky in sort of the end of May, beginning of June. And it'd be interesting to see with observations made out of it, some of these features which John has described are still, uh, still there again. For the outer three planets, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are not really visible at the present moment. Saturn went through solar conjunction on February the 6th, and by about mid towards the end of April, begin visible in the morning sky again. Uh, it's moving further north, uh, up the ecliptic, which is good. The ring inclination would be a lot less than it's been over the last few years, and it'd be down to about 8 degrees relative to the, 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 the sun and the earth. Uranus is near Venus at the present moment, but it was in solar conjunction on May the 9th, and Neptune is just uh, past solar conjunction on March the 15th. So we'd be able to see these planets more readily in the summer, autumn, and winter again. But on Uranus, um, some of you remember on one of the sky notes about this time last year, an image was shown uh, by taken by Martin Lewis. And Martin has got a very large telescope. It's a 444 millimeter Newtonian. And in this sort of animation, we've got the, the what he thinks he's just detected the rings. And I think most people think that he's detected the, 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 the most brightest ring on Uranus. There, um, it's not working, you can see a prediction, that solid line is a prediction, and when that disappears, you can see Martin's observations. So he's almost certainly ca captured this ring. Recently, he's undertaken some additional processing of this image, and here we can see the raw image, raw processed image, and you can see the rings there, and that is the prediction of where the ring should be. So I think Martin has done a really excellent observation, actually detecting the brightest ring on Uranus. We've seen this picture earlier in, in John's talk of the <coughs> conjunction between Venus and Jupiter. I think this one by Grant Pivot is very, very photogenic indeed. And from time to time, we get some of the planets come close together, or the moon appears close to one of the planets as well. And a few days ago, David captured this one with the, the sort of present moon was near Venus. And over the next couple of months, there's actually, excuse me, <coughs> some more photogenic opportunity to capture some of the planets close to together or near some of the clusters. Again, on April 11th, everything seems to happen on April 11th, Venus will be passing fairly close to Pleiades. That would be a nice photogenic opportunity if you've got a camera or binoculars. Uh, the moon and Mars will be fairly close on April 21st. And then from May the 23rd to the May 24th, we've got the Moon, Venus, and Mars fairly close together as well. There are some other conjunctions between the Moon and Jupiter, Moon and Mercury or Saturn, but these are all in heavy twilight, so I think they'd be rather difficult to see. There are some dwarf planets and asteroids around visible as well. Ceres is in the constellation Coma. Uh, it's about magnitude 7, and if you look in the BAA handbook, we'll have more details of prediction of the positions of things to be able to find, and it should be visible, easily visible in uh, binoculars. A little bit more challenging is uh, an asteroid called Iris, um, that will be on the Virgo Libra border, and it's about magnitude 9.6, so maybe a small medium telescope will be able to see this as well. Comets, well, we've been blessed by Comet 22 E3 over the last few months. I think I'm correct in saying that it's now south. It's, it's still visible from here, but it is. It's low it's down. Low it's very low down. It's, yeah. fade, it's fading away. Yeah, but this is a nice image by Peter Carson uh, from his observatory in, in Spain. And we can see the, the double tail of this comet. So it's been really good, but I think there's nothing else going on in the comet world at the present moment, really. Nothing predicted. No. No, okay. <laughs> We have a couple of meteor showers coming up over the next couple of months as well. We've got the Lyrids, which occur from April the 14th to the 30th, and the Maximums on April the 23rd. The Radiant is not too far away from the nice bright star Vega, 
And maybe if you get very clear skies, um, you may be able to go about 15 metres an hour or so, maybe a bit less. The good thing about this, conditions are very favourable because the moon is only a couple of days old and it's on maximum. And it was set out to wait before the sky gets really dark. The other meteor shower is the Eta Aquarius. And this is quite an extended shower. It lasts from April into the end of May. And the maximum is around about May 5th to 7th. Two things are not favourable to this. First of all, the radiance will be low down in the morning sky. You may have to have a twilight. And also, around the time of maximum, there's full moon. But certainly, the, probably the best shower to look at over the next couple of months is the Lyrix. Let's have a look at the night sky over the next couple of months. This shows the night sky on April 1st, about 22 hours UT or 23 hours of BST. And we've got the moon there. Uh, the winter constellations of Orion are starting to set out the way. And really, we've got the plough. It's major overhead, and all the spring constellations of Leo and Virgo and so on. And the Milky Way is out of the way as well. So this particular area of the sky is where we start to see galaxies, and there's a lot of galaxies around to, to have a look at. By the end of May, uh, things have switched out a little bit. The spring constellations have moved into the western sky, and we're now starting to see some of the summer constellations coming in as well, sort of Vega, We've got Lyra and Cygnus and so on. Of the, as I said, there's a lot of um, galaxies to have a look at. With the Pleiades really out of the way, probably the most prominent open cluster we can see is M44. And this is a really nice image taken by uh, Ivan Walton. This is a cluster that you can see with the naked eye if the conditions are good. And certainly it's a nice cluster to see with binoculars as well. For the galaxies, I must confess, I'm not a geek sky observer, but personally, two of my favourite galaxy objects are M81 and M82. And these will be virtually overhead over the next uh, couple of months, with the Earth's major being overhead. And these are two nice images taken by Carl Hansen. Uh, the, one, the two separate images, uh, which I've tried to put in the correct orientation, we've got M81 on the left, and uh, M82, the spindly uh, starburst galaxy on the right. And if conditions are good, you should be able to pick these up with binoculars, but certainly a small telescope will be able to show them as well. And certainly if you're into imaging, you can probably take some nice images like this. Another nice grouping of galaxies you'll be seeing with a relatively small telescope, the M65, M66, and the fainter NGC 3628. Uh, 65 is the uh, linear galaxy on the right, 66 is the more spiral on the left, and the fainter NGC galaxy is up there. These can be seen, I don't know, five, six inch telescope quite readily, and this picture was taken by Adam Rawlinson, but I don't think it will show up very well on the screen. But if you look on the BAA webpage of obs observations, if you have a look at this um, picture, and it's relatively recent, it sadly shows something that's rather a sign of the times because there are satellite images crossing this in several places. In fact, on the, 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 the notes that Adam put on it, he said 30% of the images he took were affected by satellites. It's a very, very sad day that say to refer to all of us who are interested in astronomy. Certainly, a, a Mr. Musk must be answerable for this. And finally, uh, the galaxies, it's down in the sort of core of Virgo boys, the famous Sombrero galaxy. And this fine image was taken by Graham with Stanley. Was it yours? It is yours. No, it's Telescope Live. The, da the data's from Telescope Live. Yeah, I was, I was just going to ask you this, this, this question. You, this is good, but was it taken remote, remotely? Yeah. yeah. Chilly. It is a, a really fine image indeed. So um, these are the many, many messier object galaxies to look through in the constellation of Coma, in Ursa Major, in Virgo. So if you get dark skies, even if you can't see them obviously as well as this, it's well worth having a look. One problem, I suppose, that we get light pollution. Um, we've got a lot more twilight over the next couple of months. And I suppose that finding very faint deep sky objects may be problematic for some people. They can get around some of the light pollution with filters. But one thing to remember is a bit easier to observe, even if the light the sky is a little bit blue, there are double stars. And in the spring, like in any time of year, there are many, many double stars to look at. 
Obviously, the most famous one for string would be Mizar and Alcor, um, nice double star in binoculars. Mizar itself is a, a double star in a small telescope. Alpha Cassiopeiae or Cor Coroli. This looks very much like the famous double star Albiro. We have the two gammas uh, in Leo and Virgo. Uh, these are fine double stars to have a look at. And if you have a look in any sort of star atlas, there's many, many double stars to have a look at. Some are, are visible in binoculars. Alpha Library is a fine object for small binoculars. It also has the, a nice proper name of Zubi El Danubi. Now, I'm not sure whether that's easy to pronounce if you're cold stone, sober or have had a few beers, but it's still a nice sort of object to look at. And certainly towards the end of the month, we've got the, the constellations of uh, Lyra, with the famous double-double star, Epsilon Lyra. And in, in Cygnus, we've got Albiro. So if you look in some of the catalogs, even if you've got slightly light blue for skies, there are many, many double stars that you can see as well. There are many variable stars visible throughout the sky, uh, but Jeremy Shears, director of the Variable Star Section, has recommended two because they're easily visible in binoculars. <coughs> the first one is RWCP, and on the BAA uh, Variable Star Section website, you'll be able to see finder charts and uh, comparison star charts for observing these stars. Uh, this is a fine image taken by uh, Mazin Yumas in Morocco, and shows this uh, Sharpless Nebula here. But this is RWC by a sort of reddish star. And over the last few years, here's a light curve going back to perhaps around 2029, 20, uh, 2019, this star often stays within about magnitude 6 to 7.3. But recently, it has started to show a fade where it's dipped down to about magnitude 7.7 .7 or 7.8. And now it's contrary to its normal behaviour. Recent observations have shown that it's starting to brighten again. And there is speculation that this might be caused by a dust outbreak around the star, very similar to what we saw with the fading of Betelgeuse a couple of years ago. But this is true or not, I'm not exactly sure. The other star that Jeremy has recommended for observers to use binoculars with is Chi Cygni. This is a very long period variable star. It varies from uh, its, its magnitude range because it's quite enormous. It's magnitude 3 down to 14. So when it's at magnitude 3, it'd be visible to the naked eye. At magnitude 14, you need a larger telescope. But as you can see here, it's starting to brighten now, and it's in with the range of binoculars. So over the next couple of months, it'd be an object that you can see with binoculars, an object which normally requires a larger telescope to see as well. So you'd be able to follow this into the spring and the summer and see how it varies. And as James has said, there'll be <coughs> charts on the BAA Variable Star Section website for able you to find this. So I think it's just about time. And James, I'd like to finish. And thanks very much for listening. <laughs>